We start. We should have some kind of... First and foremost, but we'll start easy and we'll get harder after that. Okay. Could you give me your name and spell it for me, please? Okay. Vivian Brandel, V-I-V-I-A-N, B-R-A-N-D-A-L. Any other title that you want to go after that? Um, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. Okay. <laughs> should I do that or should I do the, the lagoon? Council or the yeah. corporation. I'm on both. It, it depends. If you want a title after, you can. If you don't want a title after, you don't have to have one. It's, it's we're gonna put a little uh, your name, you know, down below as you're talking. And so if you wanted something after it, we would put that. Oh, okay. Um, Probably the corporation. Yeah, I'm secretary on the Chignik Lagoon Village Corp or Chignik Lagoon uh, Native Corporation, I should say. Okay. All right. Um. Uh, how long have you lived here in Chicken Um, lifelong. Okay. Um, tell me about uh, Chicken Cocoon when you were growing up. Yeah, that that's something I would like to say is, uh, yeah, I can remember back when, when we were growing up and uh, now this is, this is it. I <laughs> don't look at, am I supposed to look at you all the time or? Well, uh, just don't look at the camera. Okay. We're, just, we're talking. The okay. Not the camera's not here. Okay. All right, um, I can remember fishing with my dad when I was uh, 12 and 13 years old. We fished out here as family. I think we probably were the first family fishing that there was in the lagoon. And uh, we, I think I fished for him for two years. We fished without uh, power blocks. We um, pulled the seine in by hand and uh, then I, uh, after I got married, I fished with my husband, and the, let's see, the, the most important parts of, of this growing up, I think, was being able to, uh, to go out and get fish anytime you wanted, anywhere you wanted. We lived off the land. We lived off moose, caribou, clams, um, mainly fish, and uh, we just, you know, it was a complete subsistence lifestyle for us. And uh, as time went on, we, you know, we just, uh, I fished with Alec for um, 17 or 18 years, I guess. We fished family after we had our children, and um, we had five children, two boys and three girls, and we had, uh, we fished family, and we did real good. We uh, were able to to make a living off of it with uh, just our children. And they were only, uh, our children, I think Hank was uh, 10 when we first started and Rhonda was 11. And we worked family, so. Um, uh, let's see, what else? <laughs> um, well, just tell me about, uh, tell me about the community here. You know, I've never been here before, so describe the place to me. Oh, okay. Well, you know, uh, this was a really tight-knit community. Always was a very tight-knit community. We, um, you know, we were all we're all relatives. That's true. But everybody got along. Everybody worked together, and uh, we we just we just were a really tight community. And everybody helped each other, and it was uh, really really a great place to grow up. It was uh, clean, and uh, there was a lot of uh, you know, there was a lot of family interaction, and uh, it was a great place. Um, and I'm using that was <laughs> because there are other things that have happened uh, in the later years that are not as good as they used to be. There wasn't a lot of alcohol. There was, um, you know, people were, were happy, and um, we didn't have, we didn't have to have a, uh, any kind of law because everybody was, you know, everybody worked on it the way they should have. And it was, uh, to me, it was really a great life, I thought. I sure was happy all, all of it and, and I, you know, our kids grew up here and this was the best place for them to be. There was, you didn't have to worry about them. They were, they were able to go out and play and grow up great and you didn't have to worry about them. And now, no, it's it's gotten different, but you know, it's it was great there, for our kids. All right, but you're doing fine. 
Okay. Uh, so let's talk about now. Okay. In the last uh, three years, um, our, our community has gotten uh, torn apart. We've, uh, our co the co-op came along. You know, we were having a hard time. Things were getting a little tough. Fishing, uh, the prices were going down, and uh, fish weren't coming back as they should have, uh, or so it seemed. But it was just lulls in the years. We had great fishing years in between there. Uh, the fish came back. We had great prices. Our prices were up to almost uh, $2 a pound. And then they started gradually dropping. And then, then lifestyle started getting a little harder. And uh, in the past three years, we had got a co-op in here. And for those who didn't join the co-op, it really made a difference. I'll tell you, the community is split up. Um, Okay. About recent developments. Uh, okay. Um, in the past three years, we've uh, we've noticed a whole lot of difference in the in the community. The community is split apart. The co-op came in. Well, before that, we had uh, we had summers that were really great. Our fishing was great, and we had uh, a lot of fish. We had good prices, and then gradually the prices started going down. The market was going, but uh, we could have done it if, if uh, you know, if we'd have kept working at it. There would have been some people would have had to stop fishing, but a lot of them don't come back anyway. I mean, they don't live here. They don't, you know, they don't need to come here and fish. So, um, what uh, what happened after that is somebody came in and they put the co-op in here. They decided that if they couldn't uh, make it make it one way, they'd make it the other by completely combining. And there were some people who didn't, who had principles. They decided they were going to fish the way they wanted to. I mean, they had done for years and years and years since they were the first time they were fishing. And so, you know, that, that split everybody up because it, uh, they got the co-op, got priority on everything. We were, the, those independents who didn't want to fish that way were left out and uh, they got to fish the first year, that I think they got to fish 15 days in the summer of three months, and uh, the second year it was about the same, and this year it's the same again. They've only had four days of fishing so far, and it's July. So um, you, you ask yourself, how are they going to make it? And it's really put a big uh, division in between the families because I mean, there's families who are in the co-op and families who aren't, and those who are in the co-op, uh, you know, the, the, what they're doing to us is they're going against everything we've ever believed in. Plus, they're cutting off the river up here. They're, they've got nets across the river, and uh, they, we feel that's really wrong because the fish can't go up. I mean, if you have a river and you have two nets with only 100 feet between of it, and a lot of times it isn't because that's been... <clears throat> that's been, uh, excuse me, um, they've gone up there and pi take, taken pictures of it, and a lot of times they have it closed further than that. So you wonder how are the fish going to get up? And this is affecting the lifestyle, uh, the subsistence lifestyle of those around who are up the, who living up the are living up the lakes. There, they they can't get fish. Their people are got nets out, and they can't get their fish above the weir. They've always done that, and they can't get them. And it's it's really, we feel our our fisheries is being decimated by what they're doing. And and the thing about it is, is is if you can't fish out here without putting nets across the river where the fish run, it doesn't seem right. And it's it's not not what we want. I mean, we live here year round. A lot of these people who come and fish in the summer. They don't. Uh, they don't stay here. Their money goes. They they go, and they don't stay here. But we have to stay here. We don't have to stay here, but we do because this is our home. So um, we feel really angry about all that. That's not. That's not what we want for our village, and and I'm sure all the other village are, villages are in the same position because the lifestyle, subsistence lifestyle is going going to go if they, they don't stop this. So, you know, we've written letters, we've done a lot of things to try to, to get them to understand that this is not what we want. And we live here, all those who live here year-round, or just about all of those who live here year-round, 
are those who don't, are not in the co-op. So, you know, those who who are in the co-op have mostly all, they mostly live out in Anchorage and Kodiak and all the other places. So, you know, they don't uh, they don't have to watch our village go down. Our our economy has gone down so bad in the village that uh, we had a store, but it's going to close this fall because of that. There's no money here. They have to. They just can't make it on that. So our store is going to go, and um, the money in the village is is uh, gone down. Um, this about the only jobs left now are the school and the uh, what the jobs that come in on grants and things like that. That's about all that's left. Uh, those. So um, we got people that work that live in the community that work in the co-op, and we also got the independent fishers too. Mm -hmm. It really, it really um, divides it up. I mean, there's people who are in this community who are a co-op and those who aren't, and there's such a, there's a, so much hard feelings that um, I try not to get to into it, but I, every, you take a guy who, who's, uh, who's bought himself a license, he's paid $350 for this fishing license, and uh, he can't go out there and fish when the co-op is fishing because the state says he can, the law says he can't. And so if you are in that man's shoes and you have the same license as the people in the co-op do, yet you can't go out there and fish, you know, that doesn't make for very good feelings. That really makes for hard feelings. And you can tell it, the people, um, there's people in, that are our relatives that we don't even, you know, we really don't have anything to do with anymore simply because of the hard feelings in for, with the co-op and what they've done to our villages. And I don't know about the other villages, but this village has definitely felt the impact. So that's uh, something I think we've tried to get, uh, um, we've tried to get some recognition with the government, but they don't seem to recognize that what's happening with this co-op is, is really hurting this village. And I'm sure the other ones too, because I've talked to other people, and they feel the same way. So, okay. uh, is there anything else that you want to say um, now that you have the opportunity? Um, Any other issues you want to talk about, or anything else? That yeah, there's other things like hunting. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, that's one other thing that that the uh, that the government has, the state has. Uh, I think have they've overhunted. We used to get caribou here, always get caribou. Now you have to get a tier two license, and you, if you're lucky, if you see a caribou ever, they've hunt, been hunted out so bad by the uh, sport hunters, and you know, they just, they just, uh, there is no more. You have to get a tier two license. And if you don't get that tier two license, and you're not allowed to go get caribou, and even if you do get a tier two license, if you can find a caribou anywhere, you have to go miles way inland, whereas you used to be able to get them, um, you know, along the shorelines. You didn't have to go way up into the inland to get them. Now you have to travel for miles and miles to get a caribou. And we haven't had uh, caribou in a long time. I mean, not that we got ourselves. We've gotten some from other people, but, you know, you don't get very much when you do that because there isn't enough to go around. So that's something I think that uh, that is really a bad thing for our subsistence lifestyle. And moose are the same. It's, it's not exactly easy to get moose anymore either. And they used, to be a, they used to be around a lot here before. The only thing we have a lot of is bear. Um, seems like we have a problem with bear. All the villages have a problem with bear coming in because evidently there's not enough fish in the creeks up there, in the rivers up there to feed the bear. But we have one hanging around right now here. And he hasn't been a nuisance yet, but you know, you're kind of afraid when there's one around that you know, kids will run into it. But that's that's uh, something I really think that um, that has gone bad in the past. Oh, I'd guess six or seven years, ten years, because we used to go out caribou hunting all the time and uh, family and and get caribou as much as we need it, and then we were good for the winter. But now you can't go out and get them anymore. There, uh, as a matter of fact, I was on teleconference a few times when the, before the tier two came up, I tried to, uh, to get them to stop the hunt, sport hunters come, uh, from coming in and hunting. 
and I was just one in the, this village. There was, we had a teleconference with people from all the villages, and I was just one of them in this village. And I, uh, you know, we were hoping that they would change the laws with, uh, if they found out that that it was getting, uh, so that you couldn't get anything here. The caribou were being decimated by the sport hunters, and that's what happened. Now, now even they can't hunt around here. There's no caribou hunting except for a few subsistence hunters and the tier two license, and if they can find them and get the tier two license. So, you know, that's uh, that's another thing that I think they that should be looked into by the state. And it's really a it's really a sad thing because if you live on subsistence, you you need all these things. So. I think that's all, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, first of all, give me your name and spell it for me. Alec Brandle, A L E C, A L E C Brandle, B R A N D A L. Okay. And how long have you lived here? All my life. All right. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about uh, growing up here. Well, I just grew up, you know. Uh, I trapped, fished all my life. I've been fishing for 57 years now, so it's been quite a while. How, how big was the community? Uh, when it wasn't very big then. It's, it's getting bigger all the time, but you know, it's the, well, I think we made a, enlarged it quite a bit. There were kids, uh, grandkids and things, you know, things like that. And everyone else did the same thing. Built a little more houses around here. And they never used to look like this about 40 years ago. But the salmon matter the fishing was always the same until uh, things started happening here. And what really happened, I blame this on the state of Alaska. When the state of Alaska uh, took this over, there was no protection whatsoever, you know, for uh, the fish and everything. If you went up and told them about something was being wrong, they say we don't have the money for the protection and things like that. Well, you have to have protection for, for game or fish. That's just. But the part that really gets me is this, this co-op up here. <laughs> now, we went out and bought a license, and we have the same thing as anyone else has. And we have markers up in that place up there, in that river. Well, they, they have a seine stretched above that, those markers. And when it opens for us, they have an allegation here, you know, where we can't go fishing the same time they can. And like I say, I fished all my life, and we all did. So we have to go along up here, and then, uh, we got to fish below those markers where the seine is where they fish, and they have a seine across this thing. And another thing is that, you know, if you're going to manage a thing, now years ago, the last two years, this, this bay was probably only close to a couple of days or something like that, or a day. It was open from the day it opened in June right until the end of the season. There is no way you can manage something like that here when you have, a, you know, when you have a seine up across that creek because you have a, a little river running up there and you have a weir in there. And he's getting five, ten, fifteen thousand fish a day with a seine back there. And they're, they're, the idea of that seine was to catch those fish. You know, there's no way you can you catch fish up there. There's people up in the, in the lakes there that I talked to, and they said they uh, well, I just heard the other day over the radio they had a you know they're getting their fish from down here. Now if there was ten or fifteen thousand fish went up through that river. <laughs> I mean, it's only about from here to that skiff down there uh, wide. You put some gillnets across here, you're going to get some. Well, they weren't getting any. But ever since it seemed like the state took over, it's I call it paper fish. Because I, I, I was born and raised here, and I've been up, uh, you know, I go up here every fall, and I've seen fish all over the place, even in the bad years. Of course, we'd close it down. We, we spent 15 years on a beach building this place back up because the traps were in here. We took those out, you know. And it came back real big. I mean, with was big money in it. You know, it was good price for the fish and everything like that. Well, then the state of Alaska took it over, and uh, it just wasn't managed right. And this here's not being, if anybody's going to try and tell me this is managed in the place, but you put a seine across down below the weir, <laughs> and they're going to catch everything against it. Our idea that seine there in the first place is to get the fish going up there. How are you going to get 10, 15,000 a mile or so up to, or whatever it is from there up to that, that weir? It's impossible. There's no fish up there. There hasn't ever been any fish up there in those last 20 years. You get a few around there, but there's nothing like it's supposed to be. The bears took off, and 
They're all, that's the reason why we have beer around there, because they have nothing to eat, you know. You go around, there's a guy over here I talked to this summer, and this is something that's never happened. He had a bear climb on top of his boat, or actually he had a bear go along, laying by the dock and threw a chunk of guard off of that thing and got on top of the boat. There was no fish on there, but you know, the sands, they, they probably smell like fish, looking for something to eat. Now these animals never did that before. And of course, it's, uh, it's really a mess. It, uh, that co-op thing, uh, you know, is <laughs> for us, like I say, we, we own the same thing as anybody else as far as license go, and we should, all, when, they, when, we, when this bay opens, we're supposed to go fishing, you know. We're not supposed to wait here until these guys go up here and put a seine across the creek, and that's not the only thing they did. They had seine stretch across down the bottom here. I saw it a couple times, and so did other people see it. Two beast seines tied together on the mouth of this lagoon. In fact, this one guy even tried a purse seine out there this year. I guess it didn't work. Too much junk is too deep. And these are the kind of things we had pulling us in the last three years. I think I fished 12 years last, or 12 days last year, and I fished about the first year and last year. This year, I didn't even go fishing at all. And so far, these guys uh, have only got three openings, you know. And there's five villages that depend off of this, this fishery here. The Perryville, Ivanoff, uh, Chignik, Lagoon, and Lakes. There's a few guys in, those, in there that has, went for the co-op, but that doesn't mean to say there's, uh, you know, that's just a few people there. How about all the people that's left uh, without jobs? There's a whole bunch of kids that grew up fishing here. They're without jobs. They won't go fishing with these guys because most of them don't get paid anyway. Um. Co-op, like um, when did it get started? What is it? How did it get started? Well, I think it was just for a lot of people figured they were going to sit back and have a check coming in all the time, which is fine for the guys that don't catch any fish, probably. But you know, these guys here—they're not making that much money in this co-op here. And some of those guys have boat payments to make, and if you're going to pay a crew, you got to pay a crew, or you're not going to have a crew. And that's one of their problems that they ran into. Uh, it ain't working. It's been splattered all over every paper and then uh, on the news about how good it was working or helping these people out. There's a lot of people here who's really mad about this, but I'll tell you. And it seems like every time we try to get something in or to get on, t on, the, on the, in the news, it was blocked, you know. They just didn't, wouldn't put it on there. They had a good reason for that. But uh, it took us 15 years last time to build this up, and that was, uh, you know, because they had traps in here. Well, if we're going to do that, have this net across and, and a whole bunch of us is going to be sitting here, why don't we just put two more traps in there and at least they had about a mile between them or half a mile between them where the fish could go up and then everybody would benefit off these five willies. By, even if the kid was born today, he'd benefit, you know, he'd probably get a share of it too. Instead of just letting the whole thing go out of here, the guys that came here in the first place, they're not even from here that started it. And there's only like uh, me and I, and, and me and I are very, very independent, but uh, I won't go fishing for that bloody uh, co-op, no way. It's stupid. If I can't go out fishing when its bay is open, well then I may as well just get rid of my permit and everything. But what I've really done to it right now, that, like I say, you know, that, that those fish were never took, maybe the first two years they took it over, but after that there it was all paper fish. And then it was uh, taking percentage off of a catch that was fish were caught on the outside. We don't even know if those fish were coming in here. They were probably gone to Cook's Inlet someplace. In fact, I, I'm sure it's where they were gone. And they took a, and if they caught a bunch of fish out there. We sit in here one time fishing for 21 days and there was no fish. So I got talking to those guys and they said, oh, we take, they take a percentage off of the cash that was caught outside. You can't count anything that's caught in the, or, you know, that's caught on outside. You gotta have those fish up here. It doesn't do us a bit of good to what they caught outside is what we get up in this river up here. That's what we live off of. It's like money in the bank, and we always know we're going to have a bad year, maybe, for one reason or another, but we know those fish are up there. And those are the ones that come back. It's just like taking a garden and don't put seed in it. It ain't going to grow. As simple as that. There's a lot of other things I'd like to see, but I get carried <laughs> away too far. Um. But, you know, I fished all my life, and. I made a good living off of it. We all did. <laughs> so I don't know. As 
far as I, the way I see it now, if it took 15 years last time to build it back, it's going to take 30 years this time. So what do we need to do to, to get things? Well, actually what's going to have to be done is just like you did before. Just close the bloody bay off. Close it down. I remember fishing this place, get one, one uh, day in June uh, uh, a season. It was closed off. And we fish on the outside for humpies and dogs. There's a lot of things wrong with just managing this thing. It's another thing, you go outside fishing, what they do, they want the bright fish and everything. And I've saw this myself. I've never did it, but I know all the guys that did it, or seen it done. Take all the humps and dogs and dump them. That's not managing anything. We used to make a living off that before. We, we couldn't fish in here, we went outside and fished. We didn't have a very good season, but we made it. Just to pick the reds and silvers off and dump the rest. I saw in a bay out here a few years ago where they dumped this fish. I'll bet you that thing was about that thick to the bottom, just solid dogs and humps and things like that. I've talked to some of the guys that you have to, you have to dump about 3,500 uh, uh, humps and dogs to, to get a, a thousand red salmon. Now that, that's not managing anything. That's stupid, you're killing it off. And that's exactly what's happening here, you're killing it off. There won't be nothing up here. I mean, there is nothing up here right now. I mean, you can't even get subsistence above a uh, the weir there, I mean, that's, you can take a look at it, it's just a little creek running up there, I call it, it's a little river, you know, it's a river. But there's five villages that depend off this thing. Maybe it's not the guys with the permits are in the co-op, but there's sure a lot of people in those villages that depend off of it. So, it's about as simple as that. Okay. Can I hear?
First of all, can you tell me your name and spell it for me? Uh, my name is Michael Gruner. I've, uh, um, I've been uh, living in Chignik Lagoon, born and raised in Chignik Lagoon. I'm a fisherman. Um, Could you spell that's about name? all. That's about all. <laughs> Could you spell your name? Huh? Could you spell your name for me? G R U N E R T. Mike. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry. How long did you say you've lived here in? Chignik? Well, I'm 49 years old. I've pretty much lived Chignik Lagoon all my life. So. Uh, uh, tell me about Chignik Lagoon when you were younger, like when you were a kid growing up. How was it to grow up here? Uh, you're gonna have to. I, I, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Know. Okay. Um, how was it growing up here in Chignik Lagoon? Well, it, it's a, it's a. I would say.